meeting Wednesday. After work with their team, the work week is almost done and it's almost the weekend. Thank you for coming out this evening, uh, joining us at Beeswax, place we'll meet up. Uh, tonight, well, we're changing the format a little bit. We're going to try uh, two smaller talks. We'll call them lightning talks or really fast talks or something like that. But um, tonight we have uh, Sophie and Omero. Uh, I hope God I said that right. Um, Homie, or oh, homie, yeah. as he right, said. Yeah. Uh, so Sophie is going to demonstrate how awesome Ansible Lint is. Um, as somebody who started using this recently, I 100% agree that it is a super awesome tool. And uh, Omero is going to talk about uh, build pipelines and Ansible Tower and show us how you can quickly get up to date, get up to speed on deploying your Ansible changes with pipelines in safe and testable ways. So uh, first I want to have, um, uh, Rob said he had a couple of, uh, well, Beeswax uses Ansible, and they have a really unique uh, implementation in the way that they use it. So he's going to give us a quick uh, couple of slides, talk about how it works, talk about what Beeswax does, and then hopefully they'll give an even bigger talk next time and uh, kind of give some insights into it. So uh, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Beeswax, and thanks, everyone, for coming out. And I uh, hope everyone enjoys the talk. Thank you. Uh, welcome to Beeswax. Uh, Super excited that we're finally engaging with like, the Ansible community. Uh, it's about that. <laughs> so this is a company that uh, we started about four years ago, one of the founders and the CTO. Uh, as far as this audience is concerned, I think it's sufficient to understand that Beeswax is an asset platform that's fully managed uh, on top of AWS. Uh, we process millions of requests per second from our partners, so it's a pretty high-scale uh, system. And we try to have tail latencies, uh, like 99 percentile latency, uh, uh, around like 30 milliseconds or so. So it's pretty high scale, high performance uh, system that we deal with. And so we have enormous scale in terms of the like, number of machines that we use. Uh, a system of this scale also produces a lot of data. Uh, that data is constantly being uh, logged into streams. And then there are these complex pipelines that are processing these streams and then producing actionable insights for our customers to make sense of what's going on in this platform. Uh, and that sort of forms the basis of the data platform uh, within Beeswax. And finally, we have uh, a team that uh, you know, works on the RESTful API and the UI, which is ultimately the touch point of uh, the product with our customers. So we could have all the sophisticated uh, technology in the back end, but the only way for our customers to interact and engage with the product is through the UI and the API, uh, which Currently, we are uh, you know, putting in a lot of effort uh, to make it uh, really useful for extremely powerful uh, ad creators uh, for them to like, build custom applications and for them to be able to do like, interesting things. But, so, so this is like a very high level uh, introduction to Beeswax. The main things I wanted to get across are that we are on AWS. It's a fully cloud-based environment. We have enormous scale, lots and lots of machines uh, that we manage. We are a very, very small team. So automation is critical for us to get our job. So, uh, as I said, we started the company four years ago, but Ansible was really started, uh, I mean, we started using Ansible only about two years ago. That kind of coincides with the first SRE that we uh, hired at these right. So this is what happens if you have engineers uh, run amok and, uh, and try to like uh, uh, manage production. Uh, so we ended up running a whole bunch of tools ourselves, which we are uh, try to get rid of and, and move to like more standardized uh, approach using Ansible. So within Beeswax, we use Ansible in the following ways. We provision AMIs using Ansible playbooks and roles. So the combination of Packer and Ansible is what we use to build reusable machine images that then uh, are deployed to our fleet of uh, machines on, on the Kubernetes cloud. Uh, then we leverage this uh, service from AWS called GoToBug, which gets triggered whenever there is an auto scale event uh, that happens on, uh, on you know, the different auto scale groups that we run. So uh, whenever there's a scale up event, uh, GoToBug can uh, trigger our playbooks, which can then be used uh, to you know, tweak services and trigger them, etc. So. Uh, the biggest advantage we've had ever since we moved to Ansible is that we have these reusable roles that can be applied across services. So imagine that if you're trying to install like a monitoring daemon on every single one of your uh, instances, 
it's now possible to like write a single row and uh, and then have that be triggered uh, based on events. Previously, we had like n copies of the shell scripts, which is not great. Uh, the other big initiative that we are uh, embarking on is a mechanism by which we can provision consistent environments across dev, test, and uh, and prod. Uh, given that we were a small company, we were able to get away with the engineers trying to like push uh, code from their uh, workstations to production, but that's no longer going to be the case. Uh, and the challenge that, that we have here is that uh, we have a mono repo with many different services in a single repo, so being able to provision a dev environment that makes sense for the, the engineers and the product that they're working on uh, is, is a big challenge. And finally, this might be the most contentious thing that we're doing, uh, is that we're trying to like provision Docker containers also using pattern Ansible. So we found Ansible, we love it, and so we're like addicted to it, and now we want to use it for everything, including uh, building containers. Um, and this is one place where you know, later on I'd love to like talk to folks who are more experienced in Ansible than we are, because uh, there are definitely drawbacks to doing uh, you know, building containers using Ansible, you end up with these gigantic layers uh, for like every uh, you know playbook that you're on. And so, folks have experience with tools that can help uh, improve that, uh, that. And that's basically it. Uh, thanks uh, again for coming here. Would love to like uh, interact with everyone and uh, and know more about how you guys are using Ansible. Question? Um, yeah, I recently gave a talk uh, managing a fleet of Linux desktops in Ansible uh -huh. at the conference deck conf at CZ. Uh -huh. um, if you like, you could bring up, you could download the slides and okay. uh, present it in like 15 minutes or so. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we'll take that 15 minutes to do that. So. That would be really helpful. Yes, that would be awesome. <laughs> okay. It would really like help us understand what are like some of the best practices. Um, Right. Yeah, there's some generic best practices in this, you know, desktop, us, workstation specific best practices. Perfect. So, Perfect. All right, so you can find just download the slides off of the Dev CD website. Sure. We got a couple minutes of crack in the deck and get it. Are you ready? Fantastic. Cool. Great. Any questions? Cool. Thank you, Rob. about Ansible Linux. This is going to be a very introductory level talk. I've seen a lot of really rough Ansible out there, so I just thought, you know, there's a, a great tool that helps smooth out those issues. Um, a little bit about myself before I go on. Uh, my name is oh, Sophia Nieves. I have worked for eight years in the internet hosting industry, and I spent the past three of those eight years at Rackspace. I'm currently the Linux systems engineer working with the frontline support team. So, uh, when, I was, when I first heard about Ansible Lint, I was kind of wondering, why Lint? What does that mean? Like, I know Lint is that like fluff, fluffy detritus you find in your pockets, and, like your navel, which is like, kind of a skin pocket. Um, but as I read more, I, I started thinking about code, and I'm just like, okay, we all have like habits, and we produce like fluff and detritus in our code that doesn't really produce value and kind of has uh, kind of drags it down a little bit, and kind of like brings out the quality. And I was like, okay, that's lit. And uh, that definition there, I pulled it from Wiktionary, but Wiktionary also has the origin for lint. Uh, there's a tool called Lint or Linter, I think, written in 1978 for um, a for a C code. And linting is it was written as like it's a static analysis tool. Um, the person who wrote it didn't want to like pass their code through the compiler every time. And, you know that's that can be expensive, especially in the 70s when you know, CPUs are not quite as fast as they are today. So, you know, you static analysis, analyze the code without actually executing it. And that's where we got lint, linting from. It. And so, in 2013, Will Thames wrote, uh, made the first commit to Ansible Lint. And then five years later, 2018, Ansible Lint is now an official Red Hat Ansible project. So, this is, this is it. And here, Oh, I should warn you, there's a lot of screenshots of text. Uh, here, first example is unlinted code. I pulled it from the Ansible examples 
a repository, and it is, it's pretty old-fashioned. You see here, local app, the command module is passed through, and it's kind of hard to tell like which part is the module, which part is actually the command, unless you've already written a lot of Ansible. And so after linting, you see here that the a local action was replaced with a delegate to, which was introduced later. You can delegate uh, tasks, so arbitrary posts. You don't have to say, like, oh, I just want to run this on this one post. Your URL is on one line, on a different line. You don't have to use the curl command because Ansible provides for you a wrapper in the form of a URI module. And that's what Ansible link does for you. It kind of points you in the right direction. And to get started, you want to install Ansible Lint. Ansible Lint is available from PyPy, so you just hit install it. It is typically available uh, from the pack, uh, default package repositories if you're running Linux. It's available in Gru uh, if you're on Mac OS. Uh, just be warned if you're running Linux, like say an Ubuntu LTS version, the version might be kind of old, so I always recommend installing it through PIP. And then, if you want to, when you're running it, you just Ansible Lint, and then your playbook. Cool thing about Ansible Lint is if you have a lot of imports, includes, if you're calling a role file, it'll go through the role and all your imports and includes, and lint those as well. Uh, we see here, cursor, on linting, main.yml, but it's also linting this php7-fpm.yml. So it'll go through and tell you everything that could be better about all these files. And you'll notice that there are also numbers, and those are the rule numbers. And, uh, each of those first digits, uh, they have like uh, categories. And I'll talk, talk a, little, a little bit more about those. But say I don't care about that rule number 602, which is don't compare it on an empty screen. It's kind of a holdover from Python where you can, there are different methods for determining if a string is empty. You don't have to say a, compare, a comparison to an empty string. But let's say I just, I want to do it that way. I can pass dash x for exclude 602 in my file. And it'll just not tell me about it. Uh, it'll tell me about what I've done. Here. But then let's say I don't want to type dash x 602 every time. I can also use a configuration file in the form of .ansible lint. And I just add it to my skip list, rule 602. And that can be a little bit more wieldy since you can just put every rule you don't want to hear about. So there's, there's a lot of different rules rule types, uh, rule classes. Pull up my notes so I can kind of explain each one a little bit more. Uh, but your first rule set, these are deprecated modules. Ansible Lint will tell you if you're using a deprecated module. You can usually verify this by checking in the, the Ansible module index or your Ansible doc command. Uh, next one is formatting. This is usually the one we'll see most commonly. Uh, you'll usually see like you left a blank line at the end of a file. Uh, maybe you added too many new lines. Uh, maybe you ended your YAML document with the three dots and then put new lines after it. That's where you see. Now, the error class, the 3xx, is the most interesting one. That's the one I see most often in old Ansible code. It's uh, the earlier when I pointed out that in, when you're using curl with the command module, that's not necessary. You can use a URI module. That's your command shell. Uh, error class. You'll see that comes up a lot uh, if you're using, like if say if you're using command module to install packages or uh, on tar file, you should be using an archive, you should be using the package module or your app module or your yum module. Uh, that one comes up a lot and that's usually where I do cleanup duty uh, in my line of work. Uh, now the uh, 400 error class, module specific errors. I don't think there are any current active rules. I actually haven't seen it, but those are like ways to use specific modules better. 
I'd have to dig through the Ansible Lint source to find an example. I didn't do that for this, but it almost hardly ever comes up. But it's there if you ever want to contribute one. Now, task errors, uh, those are only one I ever see come up is if you're iterating rapidly, you know, you're pumping out like tasks, you're just writing a huge playbook and you forget to name your tasks, that's how it comes up. Fine. 600 idiom errors. Now I remember I said earlier the 602 when you compare an empty string or you compare to true or false to a Boolean value. Uh, that's not idiomatic Python. So uh, Ansible borrows that and turns that into an error class. So instead of saying, uh, let's say, if this file exists, equals equals true. In Python, you can just say, you know, if this file exists, and it'll evaluate to true, and then carry on. And so we'll that. And then your final class, uh, metadata. That's if you're writing a role, and you intend to package it up for uh, use in Galaxy. Uh, you can lint your metadata, and it'll tell you if, like, you didn't format the part wrong, you maybe missed, uh, like, your maintainer, along those lines. And then you can also write your own custom rules and error classes. Uh, say you really like, uh, or you really don't want a serialized list. Like say when you're using a module, and you know the format should have included an example. But say you, you can do like yum, and then do pa the package name equals this, as if you're using Ansible in the uh, the remote execution form and not just the playbook. You can you can define all the module options on one line, but that's not currently an Ansible lint rule. So you can write your own custom rule and say and define your own error class and do that. This particular example uh, I pulled from the Ansible lint repo. It's uh, to uh, to force all tasks to have tags. I think tags are pretty underused in Ansible, although I'm guilty of that myself. I don't use tags hardly ever. So if you ever wanted to force that on your team, then decide your way. And then there, YAML lint is out there. Uh, it's not Ansible lint per se, but you can write valid Ansible. That's not valid YAML. There's an example. Uh, I read YAML links on that main .yml from playbook from earlier, and it's pretty verbose. I honestly don't think a lot of this is an issue. It complains a lot about indentation, not technically valid YAML. Maybe if, before I commit to the master branch, I'll go back and fix this, but YAML link can't fit with your uh, Ansible links uh, work process. You can also choose to write your own custom rules that implements YAML lint rules in Ansible. Uh, if, you, if you're handy with Python, I personally am not. I, I can write it, I struggle a little bit, but it's something you need to decide with your team, as with everything. All the rules you apply to your code, decide with your team, come up with a style guide, uh, and move forward from there. That's it. Any questions? Download the slides. Yes. I'll have a PDF I'll send to you. Yeah. To awesome. Is there a fixer as well? Can you there fix is common errors? There is not. Not that I've seen. I'm sure there's one out there, but nothing official. So yes. How do you guys uh, How do you guys use it? The uh, winter. Do you just say, Hey, before you commit code, run this on your laptop? Or do you guys have it when it's committed, when it's automatically ran by the that code and it gets rejected or something? Or is it just that people get errors with their playbooks and they send it to you and then you run it on your laptop and you're like, hey. <laughs> so officially, uh, we a lot of the rules that I do maintain, uh, we have Molecule running on them. And then we have the Ansible Lint rules that we do want to apply to them uh, running through Molecule. Um, uh, if you're not familiar with Molecule, is Molecule is kind of a test harness and framework for Ansible. Uh, a lot of coverage isn't so great, 
not yet. It's something I only recently started working with. Uh, so for now, it's just uh, kind of enforced a little bit through the like, our contributing file and the repos. And we kind of check it manually when PRs are made against rules that aren't covered by Molecule yet. Cool. I feel like that could be one of the top that you guys take advantage of. I agree. That's a, mm -hmm. it's, it works. <laughs> Do they, can you, are you allowed to put an ex, um, exception to a rule inside the playbook? Because I noticed that uh, you were able to say, hey, um, ignore this particular error at the runtime, but not necessarily always inside inside the actual playbook. So there is a way of uh, you can comment in the task that you don't that you want to skip and not apply any rules to. Uh, comment no QA, so hash no QA, and then space the rule number that you don't want to apply. That's a good question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the original one does that too. Oh, okay. There was a tag you could put in. Cool, I didn't, I didn't know it. I should have downloaded it and tried it out. <laughs> it's been a while since I yeah, tried it. It's on your Linux box. Somewhere. It's got a seat in part of the link should be there too. <laughs> so, another question is, I know, um, so full disclosure, recently I've just started using um, a shell check which is uh, this uh, utility that essentially does kind of linting for bash scripts. And uh, one of the things I noticed is that I learned quite a bit from it. Um, so I wonder if when you started doing Ansible lint, like what was the first thing you kind of realized, oh, you were doing wrong all this time? Let's see. So I think the first thing uh, I emphasized earlier is the command shell paraphrase. Mm -hmm. There, Ansible has a lot of modules, and it's always adding more. So, uh, example, I didn't realize there was an unarchive module right. that I could use in place of tar. So that command shell module is always telling me about a better, safer way to do things with Ansible instead of having to rely on the shell or the command module. Awesome. So I have a question on the command shell. How sophisticated is it? Because, like, literally yesterday I spent my whole day Removing a bunch of command shells and replacing them with like, <laughs> like I did this manually, and now I'm kind of wishing that I had known about this. Stuff. So, can it, like, for example, find out if I'm using like a like AWS CLI calls from like a shell? Uh, could it like, suggest uh, even those kind of cases? Uh, I'm pretty certain it can. Uh, either that or Ansible itself will tell you that there's a better module. Uh, I don't work with a whole lot with uh, AWS directly uh, since I work at Red Space. Um, but I know that it will tell you, hey, I see you're running a young command. You might want to use R RPM or R instead of, or I see you're running RPM key or RPM or young. You might want to use one of these modules. So it should at least throw you a list of modules that you could so, use. So it's a matter of all the modules that, like, it's a matter of the large. Right. It's not super sophisticated and it won't read the options that you're using and tell you like which module exactly to use. Uh, but it might be something. <laughs> Once we have machine learning, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. cool. awesome. Thank you, Sophia. It's really cool. it's great. Uh, I don't work with these racks, but I just no, no, uh, I just, uh, 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 to give my call. Oh, uh, 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 Thanks again, Sophia. That was super awesome. Uh, next up is Romero uh, uh, and Simple CI CD with Nancy. Nice to So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Romero uh, Pulaski. I'm a senior consultant at Red Hat. Uh, I've been at Red Hat a little bit, uh, a little over two years now. Prior to Red Hat, I worked on the infrastructure as a service team at American Express. 
And prior to that, I was in school, enjoying my uh, free time. I was down in Tucson, Arizona, enjoying the sun. For some reason, I uh, moved to New York City. I don't see the sun much anymore. And, yeah. <laughs> um, you gotta work here. <laughs> yeah, actually, this is this looks like you could get some sun with the uh, natural light. It's kind of nice. Yep. Uh, so what am I gonna talk about? So I'm gonna talk about some uh, simple CI/CD patterns you can do with uh, Ansible uh, in GitLab. So I actually originally did this talk for a client. Uh, uh, since I'm a consultant, a lot of times we just get thrown out to uh, clients on engagements and. They present us with their problems, and we tell them that we're experts at this, and we, <laughs> we, uh, we figure out a solution for them. So uh, this is uh, this, this kind of this resulted from a problem that a client had, and I gave a talk about it. And, um, it actually it was Ansible Tower, so that's the Red Hat Enterprise supported version of, of uh, AWS. But I uh, changed everything around for this talk to make it a little bit more free, a little bit more open source, and it's at AWS instead of uh, Tower. Um, so, to just kind of set the scene, what I, what I want to talk about here is, let's imagine that you know I'm a uh, I'm on the infrastructure team and, and I'm I'm tasked with provisioning servers and I have to work with the application team and I have to provision those servers so the application can run on top of that um, and try to make this as seamless as possible, right? So. Let's imagine that I have a couple of different server environments. I have a dev environment and, and I have uh, some servers in there. I have a QA environment and you know I got a different set of servers in there. And I have a cloud environment and I have a different set of servers in there. And, and typically, you know, we, as you get into higher environments, maybe the amount of servers is a little bit less. But the idea is that I have three different environments. I want to move things across these environments, applications across these environments. And I want to treat the application and the infrastructure the same in each environment. Right? I don't want to uh, have special versions for each environment or whatever. I want to parameterize things and, and make it as uh, uh, homogeneous as possible. So now let's switch seats and imagine that you're the application uh, developer. You don't really care about the infrastructure, but what, you, what you're doing is you're working on your laptop here, you're working on your MacBook, you're working on your application, you're doing ones and zeros, right? you're, you're doing stuff. And, uh, uh, at some point, you're gonna you're gonna make a commit, and you're gonna commit up to the master branch. And ideally, be an application developer. Something triggers that in the dev environment on this server for the, the application lives on. That application gets uh, set up on there. It gets tested. It gets reloaded, and it's and it's live, right? And uh, I may do this for several cycles. You know, maybe all day to I'm not making different commits up to uh, the master branch of my environment. Uh, at some point, it it you're going to want to move it from this dev environment to a higher one, to a QA maybe, where uh, other people have access to it, uh, a little bit more stringent. Uh, we're going to do some different tests on it. But the idea is that we're going to merge the code from master into this QA branch, right? And, and there's going to be some vetting that happens. And, and that's going to be a manual thing to actually do that merge. Uh, we don't have, you, know, you don't really want to push code automatically into higher environments. That's typically uh, how we go in the, in the large enterprises. And, and so yeah, as soon as somebody merges this code into the QA branch, then it goes live on this server that's in the QA environment and it gets deployed, gets tested, gets reloaded. And again, you're gonna do several cycles of this. Uh, maybe we found some bugs that, that were in QA that weren't in the dev environment or maybe there's just, uh, we're working on a sprint and we're gonna do this for two weeks and, and then uh, at the end of the sprint, you know, we're finally gonna do a merge from the QA branch into the prod branch. And automatically, the code will get pushed out to prod. It will get uh, maybe tested in prod, who knows? Uh, but yeah, deployed, tested, and, and uh, be live there. And that should just happen seamlessly to me as a developer. I should just be worrying basically about developing on my master branch, pushing stuff up to that, that dev environment. And then maybe there's a, a certain team that's tasked with moving that to QA. Um, and you know, moving it from there to the prod, but I shouldn't have to worry about the infrastructure. So it's going to be pretty seamless. Um, so this is a typical pattern nowadays for, for companies that, and, and not even just companies. Um, I do software development as a hobby. Like I, I have some APIs. Uh, I have some group chats with my buddies back home in Arizona, and I have some uh, bots that, that listen to that group chat. And I actually applied these patterns. Um, and my own, my own uh, hobbies. So 
Uh, pretty simple to do this with AWX, uh, free open source with Git. Um, you don't need things like GitHub and GitLab to, to actually uh, do this CI CD. Uh, they just make things easier, especially if you're going to scale it out or if you're trying to do a multi tenancy. Uh, so, specifically for this example, I'm going to implement it with GitLab. Uh, but just uh, be aware, this, it's actually not, you don't really have to have stuff like GitLab. Uh, so, I just talked about what I envision to happen as a uh, application developer, as a uh, infrastructure team member. So let's talk about how we actually get there. So importantly, we need to structure our Git repositories in a certain way, and we need to use branches for Git in a certain way, and then we also need to uh, create our resources in Ansible AWX accordingly. So let's talk about the Git repositories first. So let's have one uh, repository, and let's call this the Ansible Inventory Repository, and then within, the, within this repo, the only thing that's going to live in here are going to be the Ansible host files that, that uh, define our different environments. So we're going to have one host file for the dev environment, we're going to have another host file for the QA environment, we're going to have the third for the pod environment. And then within this repo, you can also have the uh, group variables um, folder, the group bars folder, and then have uh, different YAML files that hold variables that can be overridden per environment uh, very easily, right? So like, let's say I could have a variable called, uh, I don't know, just foo, right? And it's in, it lives in all.yaml, and that's going to kind of act as a default. So all the groups are going to inherit that variable. But I can also then put uh, foo into dev.yaml, and then only the servers that are in the dev group will get that, and it will, get, it will override what is the server default, right? Um, so that's kind of important down the line. And then we're going to have another repository, and this is going to hold our playbooks. So the idea of the playbooks that live in this repository is going to be for them to manage the lifecycle of your application. So let's say we have, and not only the application, but the infrastructure too. So let's say we have one playbook and it's called setup server and this playbook is tasked with setting up the actual server that the application will run on. So one playbook but this should be able to build our server and the dev environment QA prod. And what this playbook is going to be tasked with doing is basically going to be tasked with, let's say we just have a bare CentOS server. Uh, so maybe do a yum update, you know, yum install packages, maybe do some hardening and, and lock down the SSH port. Just kind of generic, set up the server so that up until the point that it's ready to run the application. And then let's have another playbook. And this is actually going to be specific to whatever application we want to run, but that's going to set it up. So maybe if our application runs in a uh, Docker container, then this could do the Docker build you know, to, to build the container and then also to start it up. And, and many other prerequisites for the application to, to run. Maybe another playbook to just test the application. So lots of different ways to, to test, do, do tests, right? Um, if you're just doing simple kind of home hobbies and maybe you're doing a Ruby on Rails application, uh, you can just run the test right there on the uh, command line. It's just really specific to whatever your application needs. And another one to just reload the app. So again, this is just kind of like Whatever playbooks you need, you write, but the idea is that you're going to manage the life cycle of the application with these playbooks. And you're only going to have one copy, you're going to parameterize them well, and they should ideally be able to run in different environments. And then we have our application repo. So I'm going to be in the shoes that I am the infrastructure member, the infrastructure team. I don't really care what's in the application repo. It doesn't matter if it's Ruby on Rails, if it's a Node.js website, a uh, ASP.NET application, it doesn't really matter, it's just ones and zeros. Um, and that's how we're going to structure our repositories. And so the next thing is, how, how can we utilize branching? So the easiest thing, if, if you don't need to overcomplicate things, just have one branch for the inventory. I mean, the inventory, the inventory basically defines you know, your servers and the different server groups that you have. That's not really going to change per environment. We are going to use branching for the playbooks and for the application repo though. And the idea is that we want to have one branch per environment. So we have a master branch and that will correlate to the dev environment. We have a QA branch that will correlate to the QA environment. 
prod to prod. And so, if you're not familiar with like Git, not everyone is, right? And, and with branching, it can be kind of complicated. So I just want to uh, just kind of visualize what, what I mean by using the branches. Uh, so let's say we have these three branches. As a developer, I'm going to make a commit up to master. You know, I may do that several times. And, so, and, it, and it could be a team of people. So now we have three commits up to master, right? And at some point, we're going to choose to move that down into QA. And that's going to be a manual merge. And, and again, as soon as that's merged, that should get out, deployed out to the QA server. And once we go into QA, we found some more either missing features, we found some bugs, whatever. We make some more commits up to master. And then again, down the line, we merge into QA and we move that branch uh, along a step. And everything looks great. And so now we move that code down to the project. So that's sort of like a CD aspect of this, right? That we're kind of doing code promotion uh, from one branch slash environment to the other. And we're not doing anything environment specific. That's basically all we need to know about how we want to structure the Git repositories. So the next step is how do we create the resources in Ansible AWX um, to do what we want. So four different resources that we need to worry about. So we need to worry about projects, inventories, job templates, and workflows. And let's talk about projects first. So what are projects in Ansible AWX? Projects are basically Git repositories holding either inventories or, job or playbooks. So when we go into AWS, we're going to create one project that points to our Ansible inventory repository and the master branch on there. And the cool thing that we're about to do now is we're actually going to create one project per branch of the playbooks repository. So we're going to end up with an Ansible playbooks dev project, Ansible playbooks QA project, and a prod project. These are all going to point to the same repository, but they're actually going to reference different branches your master QA prod. Uh, inventories. So nothing too special here. We're going to create one inventory per environment, one for dev QA prod. Uh, these inventories, so AWX has the feature that your inventories can actually be coming from a project. Um, and so these inventories are actually going to be defined in the Ansible inventory project and through those close files that I showed you earlier. And just to reiterate, they point to the correlating environments. With the job templates, we're going to do something similar to the how we did the playbooks projects. We're going to set up one job template per playbook per environment. So we have the setup server playbook, right? And that's going to again, that's going to set the server up up until the point that our application is ready to get loaded on there. And so we're going to have setup server dev, setup server QA, setup server and these job templates are going to get pulled from the correlating the right project too. And so we'll basically do the same thing we had the four playbooks we saw before. We'll do the same thing um, for those. And then workflows. So what are workflows in AWX? Workflows are basically just stringing together job templates or playbooks. And the cool thing that you can do is say, um, I want to string together, for example, in the dev environment, I want to string together, one, I want the application to get set up if it's not set up already. I want the application to get tested. And depending on the result of that job template, so you can do, if this job template succeeds, then go on to the next step, which would be to reload the application. If the job template fails, I can trigger some different action, maybe a different playbook that emails me. Or, or rejects the commit and, and you know you can automate whatever you want to do. And so we can have a workflow per environment again, one for the dev environment to do the whole uh, life cycle, right? Set it up, test it, reload it. One for QA, one for prod. So how does this tie together AWX and GitLab? So we talked about the dream earlier. As a developer, I want to just like push code into master, and it gets reloaded somewhere, and then merge it into QA, and somehow it gets reloaded. So how's, how's this actually like happening under the hood? So it's, it's very easy. So we're an application developer. Once zeros, I commit up into GitLab, into the master branch. 
GitLab has a webhook configured, and basically GitLab will then send a post request over to Ansible Tower. It tells Ansible Tower, I want you to run this workflow. In this instance, when I do a commit into the master branch, the workflow I want to run is the dev workflow, and it goes out and runs this workflow against the dev environment. At some point, I merge master into QA. GitLab fires off a post request over to AWX. Same thing happens, it just triggers a different workflow. And at some point, I take QA, merge in the prod. Same exact thing. Just API calls going around and magic happens, and ideally it's seamless, and it just all works, right? That's basically it, so I have a uh, demo that I want to show you guys um, of this in action, so I'm gonna pull this stuff up. personal blog, um, right now I'm running it in three different places, right? So this is on localhost 8000, this is running on a Docker container on my laptop. Then I'm running it on my dev server, which it is my dev server actually. So this is on dev.blog.escapewq.com, this is a, a Linode server up in the cloud. And then I have the blog running on my production server, blog.escapewq.com, and this is just a different Linode server that I treat as my prod server. Um, all exactly the same, except for I have HTTPS set up on the cloud server, but not in the lower environments. So, I am the sole developer of my blog, unfortunately. But the way that I can play with it, So let's say that I'm developing my blog and I want to make a change and I just want to test it out locally, right? And, and uh, see what that change is. So for the purpose of this talk, I, I have my personal blog. I want to add a new section to it where I have talks. So I'm going to post this meetup talk that I did, okay? Can you enlarge the text, please? Enlarge it? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right. All right. So I'm adding a new subsection to New York School of New York City. Don't use it, you need to be using it as, uh, yeah, if you're working on infrastructure, you gotta be using stuff like this. Um, I'm all about learning to how to use the tools to get the job done faster, and also all about learning keyboard shortcuts so I don't have to use the mouse as much. So that's also critical. Um, okay, so I'm in my application directory right here. Uh, I want to make changes to it. I just made one that, that you saw right there, and so I'm gonna, Reload my application. Again, this is just happening on my local laptop. So that's done. So, I added a new section here, running locally, right? And, and it looks great. Ah, testimony of city, meetup.com. Um, again, you see, I go to other servers, right? Of course, they don't have to change as reflected. Um, so this looks, this looks good. So, Go ahead and commit this.
So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to push that change up. That change is going to get pushed up to uh, GitLab. It's going to get pushed out to this uh, docs repository. And as soon as that push happens to the master branch, GitLab is going to send out a post request over to Tower, and Tower is going to kick off a workflow. And so these are the jobs currently running on Tower. So nothing right now. And the talk, the way that I did the talk, right? I have like a dev environment, a QA environment, a product environment. That's cool. Like that's most enterprises have at least those three environments, and if not, a lot more. Um, for my usage, I just have dev environment is my local laptop. QA is this, or dev is just this. Uh, dev is my local laptop. QA is just a server up in the cloud, and product is another one. So I just instead of three kind of instances in the cloud, I'll get two. So as soon as I push to the master branch, I actually want the stuff to get um, reloaded in my dev environment. And the job actually ran while I was talking. Is that 35? So that was pretty quick. So over here on dev.blog.escapewq.com, you can see I refresh the page. I have my new section. Uh, looks great, but it's not out of production. So I actually forgot. I want to change one more thing. That is not the URL of the site. <laughs> So again, as a developer, you know, I'm usually making multiple commits to my lower branches and getting things right before I'm going to push it out to production. So I did a push, and then this time, if uh, we watch this, you can see that a new job just got triggered. Uh, I'm not using any workflows just because just pretty simple stuff, I didn't need a workflow. But if you click on this job template that runs, uh, basically this is what sets up the application and reloads it, reruns it. So it actually just does a git clone from GitLab, it talks back to GitLab, does a clone. Um, I don't have any tests, it's just a static, it's actually just a patching server, no static uh, pages, don't need tests for that. And reloads it, and if everything's good, then it says it comes back in green. And it's there. So production. Let's update production. I've made some meaningful changes and, and I want to uh, push that out to the world. So what I can do over here is I can do a new merge request. You can say I want to merge master into prod. And this is, you know, this is why it's manual. So you got to do some vetting of things. Like, what commits am I merging into master? Uh, what are the changes? And, and tools like GitLab let you do this very easily um, and user-friendly. And that's where I think the advantage of using tools like this uh, comes into. Everything uh, looks great to me. I did those two commits, right? I fixed the header and I added the talk section. So let's submit that merge request. Let's go back out to power and if it uh, kicks off another job. Oh, I actually have to approve and merge. There you go. So, yeah, so it kicks off a new a new uh, job template to run. And so, kind of key, uh, if, if you guys can see, is that I have two different job templates like I showed you guys, right? I had the one that runs in the dev environment. It uses the Dev playbook and it uses the inventory that targets the dev environment. Um, and then I have the one for prod and that targets all the, uh, the prod playbook and the prod environment. So not only am I actually managing um, my application in different environments and, and having uh, you know like a QA version of my uh, application and a prod version, but I'm actually applying the same principle to the playbooks that are running. So it is I do have three, I do have multiple branches for the playbook repository, and it's running the master branch of that playbook in the dev environment, and it's running the prod version of that playbook in the prod environment. So it's actually applying this to, to not only your playbooks, but to your application. And so that took a little bit longer, but it ran. 
Um, and there you go. And now I have my uh, my pod environment set up. Um, so that should be that easy, right? Even in an enterprise setting. Uh, obviously, I think a lot of the tooling and the automation and, and the API calls you got to do around all this gets a lot more complicated. Um, but the experience should be that seamless. And and if it were, then I guess you wouldn't need you know Red Hat Consulting. Uh, if it were that easy to do, and you wouldn't need to hire software engineers, but this stuff does get complicated. Um, and it's really cool when it works that well. It's really a new thing to see, and, and it just makes your job a lot more enjoyable uh, when, when things like this work well as a developer. And that's about it. You guys have questions or you want to see anything? Yeah. So. There must be some credentials you've stored in GitLab in order for it to log in the tower. Yeah. Or AWX. Right. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, so tower, so you can have users in tower, and each user can have a token associated with that user. And that token can be given read and or write access to whatever resources that user has. And so I basically have my user tower, home ski, and um, that's where I provision, or was where I set up my projects and my job templates and my inventory, and then I set a token for that user, and that token is able to kick off any jobs that I have access to. And so that's, and then in GitLab, you can have where you set up the webhooks is in this integration section. And basically, what GitLab is going to do is says, I'm going to send a post request to some endpoint that you give me that URL, and I'll give this token um, inside the header. And uh, that's what I did. Yeah. So um, when you're talking about building the inventory, right? Because at least for me, um, I'm using Ansible to provision something. Um, you know, like I have some part of the inventory or the DNS base. But I remember you mentioning at some point it talks to an AWS service to, to build the inventory, or does it are you just like yeah? How, how are we, how we yeah. Go over that? Yeah. So there's there's a lot of details in here, and I'm just glossing over stuff. But essentially, I have my inventory just defined as files, right? And they live in this repository. So I have this Ansible inventory repository. Uh, my inventory is just defined as regular Ansible host files that you're talking about. So I have one defined for my dev environment. Um, this targets dev.autographed.com. Right, I have another one set up for the product environment. This targets a, a different server. And what I was referencing that Tower can use that is basically when you create an inventory in Tower, um, the normal, I guess the default way is that you actually like go in here into some text box and you say, oh, my dev inventory, you know, this is a hosting that needs to talk to. Um, another way that you can do it is that you can create a project in Tower, and this project points to that Ansible inventory repo. And then when I go into inventories here and I, uh, I can do a source, and I can define its source from a Tower project, and then I tell which file in that project I want this inventory to get sourced from. And so what this enables me to do is to also manage my inventory in a text file that's committed into Git, right, and have it source controlled. Um, and then say if I if I added a new server to the product environment, I would add it in here. I would then commit that change into GitLab, and then I could go into projects right here, and I could. Refresh and that's going to go out to GitLab, it'll do a clone of that repository, and that will actually automatically uh, refresh the inventory in Tower for you too, which is pretty cool. So you have to predefine it, but essentially, like, there has to be like some sort of intervention. Because what, what I'm thinking of specifically is like an auto scaling group or something where the addresses are, you know, currently changing. So they'd have to, like, internally, like, register themselves with the DNS for this to work. Uh, no, actually, um, I think it, it reacts actually uh, inventory has capability of managing dynamic inventories, which is what you're saying. Um, have you have you read you read about the dynamic inventory inside Ansible playbooks, right? Yeah, you you can define hosts. 
Right. Like uh, during the play, right? is that what you're talking no, about? No, no, no. Um, so so uh, there's a bunch of scripts that for cloud provision servers, there are um, Python scripts that you have to download separately from, Am from Ansible's website, from the GitHub, that essentially allows you to put in your keys and then like query the, the inventories that you have in your cloud. And um, so your inventory doesn't have to be just INI files, it can also be a script that basically puts out a specific format. And yeah, Ansible will take a valid JSON object as an inventory. Uh, so anything they can generate that that uh, JSON format that has the list for groups plus the host bars or whatever else they want to throw in that inventory, it will just accept that as an inventory file. Uh, the way what Connie's describing is called the uh, ec2.py inventory script. And so uh, there is exactly what she says. Whatever your credentials are for AWS, um, it knows how to do an ec2 described instance, basically. And it knows how to get all of the, the tag and metadata available from AWS. And there's similar ones for Azure and GCE and uh, probably OpenStack, I think. So, uh, but if, if you had your own custom thing, you would want to write like a Python script that could interface with your CMDB and then translate that into a JSON object that, that Ansible can understand. And when you use that dash I flag, that's essentially what it's doing. It's either going to look at that INI file or expect a JSON file, uh, and it's just going to read it into memory at one time. Yeah, exactly. And then in Tower, instead of using this, uh, my, my inventory source being a file coming from a project, you can also just point it to one of these shell scripts that they're talking about and have it be a dynamic inventory. So it, uh, at runtime, you know, Tower's going to say, where are the hosts in this group? And go out and find them. And another, another pattern that I've seen is that teams have a CMDB, uh, like he's saying, and they'll actually generate the static files. Um, and so that can be source controlled in that way. Yes. Right, so um, for the major clouds, this is pretty much provided for you. The script in terms of, like like Dan says, Azure and AWS is being, you know, the two popular ones. Um, so a lot of the popular cloud ones, uh, Ansible has their own maintained, their own maintained uh, modules for it or uh, script for it. But this is, um, but this is great because uh, and you should check out like how do you dy develop your own dynamic inventory because this way allows um, pretty much like it kind of fits into the whole philosophy of Ansible where it's kind of like it's a tool that plugs into your ecosystem with the t whichever tool that you want to choose and so basically if you you know choose to write something in C that generates a JSON file you can use that as your as your inventory so. Yeah, it's, I, I recommend reading that section of the documentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so Ansible is great. Ansible, AWS, Tower, they're awesome. It's an awesome tool, but it's also very, very flexible, right? And so that can kind of cause its own issues and how flexible it is because you don't know how to use it correctly. And so I feel like you just have to be a little bit opinionated, and that opinion needs to really be, um, what, depending on what your situation is, you develop an opinion on it and you follow that process and I think it can work very well. Um, for my use case here is that I have these three server environments, I want to move this application across the environments and so my opinion is you structure your inventory in this way, your playbook repositories in this way, and things are going to flow smoothly, right? Um, you can develop your own opinion for what works in your company though. So. Cool. Well, awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know if, like, when we got to get out of here, but feel free to kind of mingle and talk for a little bit, and um, I maybe, you know, 15, 20 minutes if you guys got it. Um, uh, are these t-shirts for people? Yes. Yeah, yeah. If anybody would like a, uh, like have some swag, we got some fresh, some fresh inventory here. So <laughs> some extra larges, <laughs> some, some mediums, <laughs> some smalls, and larges. So and if you see a color you want, I don't have it. And, uh, I just want to thank again Charlie and Beeswax and Rom and Sophia and Romero. It was awesome. So and then hopefully we'll do this again uh, next month. And so if you have an idea for myself, for I might. fifteen minutes, I started working. Uh, email Connie or I. Reach out on the Ansible Meetup group, and we'd love to and to hear about what you guys are doing with the Ansible. So thank you so much, everybody. We'll get